in his world of progress and technology, man convinces himself that there's nothing out there, nothing moving in the shadows beyond the arc of his peripheral vision, nothing in the light taking account of his deeds and actions. In this podcast, we will discuss the paranormal, hauntings, spirituality, all things between the darkness and the light, angels, demons, the universe within, and the universe without. I'm Paul James Caden, and this is The Spirit Side. Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast. I'm Paul James Caden and in this episode of The Spirit Side, we are going to be talking about something that many of you listening to this podcast right now are probably not even aware that this exists. I didn't know that this existed until several days ago. I was watching YouTube and I just happened upon this video that mentioned this particular book we're going to be discussing today. I looked into this book and, and sure enough, it, it is a real thing. It's out there and it's, it's pretty bizarre. The book is called A Children's Book of Demons by Aaron Leighton or Aaron Leighton. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. I'll spell the author's name in case any of you want to uh, look this up and do your own bit of research on it. But the author is A-A-R-O-N-L-E-I-G-H-T-O-N. And the book is entitled A Children's Book of Demons. And uh, it's it's pretty strange uh, what is in this book, which we'll get into in just a little bit. But I, I think what really struck me strange about this is that in this day and age where everyone is suddenly getting hypervigilant across the internet and in society about protecting children, you know, from certain information, and we should, there are things that children shouldn't here that children shouldn't know, they should not be exposed to, and some things they not, should not be exposed to until they're older, and they can think more reasonably about these subjects. So definitely, uh, especially with the internet, we need to be a little bit more uh, diligent about what young people are watching and the information they're taking in to their young minds. But I also see that along with this, there seems to be a lot of censoring um, in this hypervigilance of protecting young people or children from certain information just seems to be another avenue to censor certain people, certain religious groups, certain people with a certain opinion. You know, we can always, uh, you know, we can always use, well, that's not good for children. Well, that's not good for this, or this is offensive to me. You know, everybody's always looking to shut someone else down. And, uh, you know, there was a sad reality of that. Uh, a friend of mine on YouTube did a video and he was showing, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this, um, where you might go on Facebook or social media and someone has a petition you can sign. We need so many uh, signatures on this petition and then we will, we'll be able to stop, you know, so-and-so or stop this from happening or take this to Congress. And there was actually someone who had a petition up to legally have YouTube pull down someone else's YouTube channel because they were about to beat the subscription number of the, you know, the number one YouTube channel that's out there that everybody's a fan of. This person is a threat. This person is a dog. They must be stopped. Sign this peti petition before they bypass PewDiePie, whoever the hell that is, uh, <laughs> and, and, sub and subscribers. You know, so people are always looking for an angle to 
drag other people down or to stop other people's freedom of speech or whatever the case may be. And that that's a sad reality of our world today. But yet other people, other people seem to get a free pass, whatever they want to do, whatever they want to say. What would happen if people started protesting some of these protesters that are protesting things that are really not bad or not against anyone's rights? You know, we'd probably have a civil war on our hands because God forbid, you know, don't protest the protesters or what they stand for. And I say all that and get on a little bit of a tangent because when we look at this uh, children's book of demons, you know, stuff like this seems like it can fly right under the radar as well as other books for children that, uh, eh, you know, can be rather dicey and in information that they shouldn't be exposed to. You know, certain people can't talk about their religion or their faith or ideals that they hold as important. That's considered not good, but then we can have people going into, you know, little elementary school children's classrooms, a man wearing a wig and a dress to read a book about why it's okay for a man to wear a wig and a dress. You know, uh, and then we can come out and, and happily publish a children's book of demons. You know, so again, it seems some people and some groups get plastered with the censorship, the, the big old stop sign, you can't do that. But other people just get that free pass to do whatever it is they want to do. And it's not necessarily uh, a good thing. You know, as I researched in this children's book of demons, uh, it, it's definitely bizarre. It's, it's, um, I don't see where this would be spiritually or even psychologically healthy for young children to read. And again, we're, we're, we're going to get into that in, in just a moment, but before we do, I, I want to just read a couple of reviews for this book that I found on the Target website. And the first one is from Rob Claw from High Low Magazine. Now, High Low has been around forever. And this is what Rob Claw writes. It's a funny take on the problems kids encounter and a kind of wish fulfillment in dealing with them. Publishers Weekly says, Lighten's rendering of the multi-eyed, multi-armed, multi sharp-toothed demons are outlandish without being creepy, and the creative concept will likely inspire some readers to create demons of their own. Now, holding that in mind, I, I just want to read a little bit of information about the gentleman who wrote this book. Now, again, uh, does this sound like someone you would allow to write a book for children and present them with this particular information And then put things in this book that uh, I, I feel are cro kind of crossing a line in, in, in a very big way. And again, we'll, we'll talk about contents of, of the book in a moment. But first, let's talk about Mr. Aaron Lighton. Okay, so it says that Aaron Lighton is an illustrator who has worked for a variety of clients including the New York Times, Chronicle Books, Harvard Business Review, Target, and Ford. He has also worked as the character designer and creative director for the Emmy Award-winning animated project The Zimmer Twins. While Aaron grew up in a small town, 
on the Canadian prairies, he now lives with his wife in Toronto, Canada, alongside a multitude of spirits and other interesting creatures. And there's another uh, description of him that says he is also uh, prolific in all things occult. So now that being said, let's talk about what uh, Mr. Leighton or Leighton uh, has presented to the children of the world in his uh, children's book of demons. Well, he actually lists in this book uh, real demons from demonology. Uh, he talks about, you know, in, in a whimsical, childish kind of way, you know, when this demon is, demon is around, uh, you know, you may experience sickness or depression or constant problems with your health. So, you know, he presents it uh, again in kind of a uh, whimsical, childlike um, manner. But these are actual demons that the real occultists or uh, people who would practice the dark arts have called upon for centuries. And, of course, he has his goofy little drawing and rendering of, of what the demon would look like so it's not scary. It looks like something that would be out of a Halloween picture book or some such thing. But he's presenting these demons, telling the kids – what their lore is, what the demon does, and then, you know, how it could help you in certain situations in your life. And there's one excerpt from the book that says, you know, rather than going home and worrying about that bully, you know, who's making your life miserable at school, uh, why not go home and summon some demons? You know, in other words, summon some demons to take care of the bully who's making your life miserable at school. And now one of the demons in this book is a demon of sickness, you know, illness, infirmity, uh, revenge. You know, there, there's all kind of uh, demons and the havoc that they can wreak in someone's life. So the book in its very whimsical, funny way uh, that uh, some people who have uh, written a review on the book seem to find so wonderful uh, is actually saying, well, ha ha kids, you know, here's this, you know, terrible demon. Here's what he does. And uh, Hey, he can be your friend and you can summon him and some of these other demons to uh, take care of your problems. Even if those problems are other people. Now we don't, see the danger in that. We don't see a problem with that. That gets a free pass. Now, also in this book, what I found to be really strange is that there is a section that gives an illustration of the magic sigil that represents these particular demons in the book. Real magic sigils. If you don't know what a sigil is, it, it, it is, I'll just say it this way, it's a magical symbol that is used in magical rites or occult rituals or black magic to cast a spell, uh, bring the energies or, or the wish to the person who is casting the spell. But sigils are also used, yes, for summoning spirits, demons, things from the world of the paranormal and the supernatural. And so what Mr. Aaron Layton does in his book is he gives the actual occult magic sigil of these particular demons in the book that the children can use to summon the demons for these purposes that whatever it is uh, that that wishful way of problem solving 
Now, again, you know, it's done in a very, you know, kind of lighthearted way. But is this safe information to be presenting to a young child? You know, what if mommy and daddy say, no, you can't have uh, that new Xbox game this week or no, you can't go spend the night at your friends this weekend and the child gets mad Well, I'll show mommy and daddy. I'm going to go in my room and summon some demons. Again, I say for the third or fourth time, we, we don't see a problem with that. What kind of mental and psychological state are we setting up for children by teaching them this? You know, it's very funny to me that everybody's up in arms about, you know, the God of the Old Testament. This is bloody. This is terrible. This is violent. And some of it is. I'm not going to say, you know, that, that that's okay either. <laughs> you know, um, you know, you're bloodthirsty God, but then they'll turn around and say, well, it's okay to send bloodthirsty demons after people to get retribution. And that's what I mean by the double standard. It's okay, not okay for this group, but it's okay for this particular group. And I think psychologically, not even talking about the spiritual ramifications at, at, at this point, but psychologically, you're setting up a mindset. I think that it's okay to seek revenge or want to hurt people that have offended you or made you unhappy in some way. Couldn't that translate over into today I might summon some demons, tomorrow I might take matters into my own hands, create my own demon and be the demon and go out there and really hurt someone because they did something I didn't like? I've said many times in this podcast, I like the old saying that I read years ago that a human being never rises morally or consciously above the level of his image of God. So if his God is bloodthirsty and vengeful and terrible and angry and jealous and a man of war, then so the man will be. So if his associate associations with things spiritual and paranormal are vengeful demons who will make you sick and hurt you and take things away from you, well, then what kind of mentality is that going to build in the child, in the person practicing this from such a very young age? I don't see the fun, the funny, or the whimsical in this. I think it's dangerous on that level alone. Not to mention that if you dabble in this sort of thing, yes, you can definitely bring some very dark, negative, and oppressive energies into your life. I mean, there are people, oh, that magic stuff doesn't work. Well, you know, there are occultists and people that have tried to do this stuff for years with no result whatsoever. But there are then are there are people who practice this and dabble in this sort of thing and they get results, but it's not quite the results that they bargained for. So I th I think we're setting up the mental, the psychological, and the spiritual aspects of these children to, to be very dark and dangerous. I mean, what parent in their right mind would give their child a book with real names of demons that are called upon in black masses and occult rituals and in demonology? Talking about these things and filled 
with the little magic symbols that will help you summon them for whatever purpose uh, you decide to call upon them for. I don't think anybody would. And, you know, I, I, I really hope that if people decide to buy this book for their kids, they take a look at it first and realize what it is, what it's saying, because what it's saying is not good by any stretch of the imagination. And again, here in our society that protests everything, why is no one protesting this? Is it because people don't know about it? It's just something that kind of snuck under the radar and it's popular among kids? I, I don't know. But why are all these retailers selling it? It's, it's everywhere. Target, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Amazon – Everywhere. As they used to say, wherever books are sold, you, you can get a children's book of demons uh, for you, the special little one in your life. Uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy if you ask me. And, you know, the, there are people out there who would say, well, this, this is part of the agenda. You know, we have leadership. In this country, we have leadership in this world that uh, is very prone to look toward the dark side, if you will. They want to control everything. They want to control the masses. They want to bring back the old ways, as some of them call it. And so they're pushing out anything that has to do with morality, God, light, love, freedom, freedom of speech. And this is the kind of thing that they want to implement into our society. You know, many say that all the politicians and people that gather together at Bohemian Grove and dance around in robes with masks on once a year, you know, in front of a uh, bonfire with a gigantic statue of a pagan god, uh, that these are the people who this is what they want their world to be. And, you know, I don't think they're so far off the mark. I don't think some of these people are so far off the mark when they, they talk about this agenda and how they want to warp society and change society, control society even thin the population down. Because some of these politicians, some of these people in in big corporations, I, I, I mean, they, they all seem to be in the same bed and they all seem to have these very warped uh, philosophies. And many of them belong to some very uh, spurious secret societies, you know? So is that why some people get censored until they can't murmur a word, but something like a children's book of demons is just kind of like, great, let's put it through. You won't even hear a whimper about this. Fine, great, good, put it out there. This is what we want. Could it be? Could it be part of that agenda for society? I say, at least in part, yes. I mean, you look at the things that these people do. I mean, you, we can look at, uh, what's his name, Prince Harry that's been all over the news, hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein. And we know what Jeffrey Epstein had done that there was a video out on, um, I believe I, I saw it on YouTube probably about two years ago, and uh, maybe a little over two years ago. 
And I'd never heard of Jeffrey Epstein uh, at that time, and and a lot of other people kind of knew the name, or they never, you know, they didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to him. And they were interviewing a young girl who said she was on a plane with Jeffrey Epstein and several well-known politicians from the United States. And this girl was under eighteen. They were going to a private island owned by this gentleman, Jeffrey Epstein. And one of our former presidents of the United States was fondling and kissing this underage girl on the plane. And she said she had been to Jeffrey Epstein's island several times, and this is the kind of thing that went on there all the time. That there were these politicians and uh, so-called elitists from all over the world having inappropriate relationships with underage girls. They they, they were made to basically be uh, like sex slaves for these people. Can't find that video now. But now we have someone like Prince Harry hanging around with, and and his name was mentioned. I mean, the royals were no stranger. As much as people love the royals, uh, they're no stranger to Epstein and this little cabal of, you know, (laughs) nasty perverts. And here we have pictures of him all over the news with young girls, Epstein stories. He's now stepping down from his duties in the royal family. But these are the kind of minds. These are the kind of people that are in charge. Perverse in a number of ways. So is it any wonder that they would, yes, they would want to dumb down society. Yes, really dumb down the younger generations. Do away with old-fashioned morality and religion. Oh, that stuff's archaic now. Now, yeah, some of that stuff is archaic and it definitely needs to go. But when it comes to the basics, like the golden rule, do unto others, treat others well. Those are the the core foundations that need to stick around. But it seems like it's being swept out of our world, swept out of our societies. I mean, you look at the Vatican. Everywhere. Everywhere there's people abusing children, underage women, underage boys caught in these weird occultic groups, a Lucifer room in the Vatican where there's a statue of of Lucifer. I mean, you know, what is going on? Well, I don't think we have to look too far or think too deep to realize what's going on. And these are the people in charge. They're in charge of our government, in charge of our countries, in in charge of our big industries. Did I say in charge of our religion? They're in charge of everything. And they all, they all sleep in the same bed, no pun intended. And when you think about this, when you know this, when you have an inkling and see the tip of the iceberg of this perverse, nasty, dark underbelly of, you know, Uh, the people who call themselves our leaders. Then we can certainly, I think, begin to get a little bit of a fine-tuned picture as to why anything that is really moral or of God or uh, of the light or of wisdom and education is being pushed right out of the the back door and garbage like a children's book of demons just gets the free pass to be 
everywhere. It's not surprising. It's not surprising, ladies and gentlemen. This is what the world is coming to. And it's sad. And it's a little disheartening to see. But I mean, for me, in the long run, I'm quite confident that the terrible actions of men will never overcome the light in the end. I'm Paul James Caden. I thank you for listening. Again, below this podcast, wherever you might be listening, is my Patreon page, my Angel Thoughts Metaphysical page, and my email if you want to contact me or support the podcast or my work in any way. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, tell me what you guys think. Drop me a line. Drop me a comment. What do you think of a children's book of demons? Do you think it's innocent fun? Or do you think this is something that's definitely stepping over a line that could be potentially hazardous to young people on a number of levels? Again, I thank you for listening. I'm Paul James Caden saying stay safe out there, everybody. Stay aware. Stay in the light. And I'll see you next time here on The Spirit Side.